You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth, the show that reveals facts, truth, research, and statistics, and never messes around. We lay down the entire truth about everything regarding your Detroit and Michigan sports teams, no matter if it's good or bad. No junk, no entertainment, no homerism, no coddling, no pop culture, no opinions, no shilling, and no fluff. Head over to our website at michigansportstruth.com, follow us on Twitter at Michigan underscore truth, and like our Facebook page, The Michigan Sports Truth. The hosts of the Michigan Sports Truth podcast do not take any suggestions or criticism from any member of its audience on how it should be run. It is up to the host to decide what they want to cover. They also do not intend to be any amount of popular in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Additionally, the views of the audience, right or wrong, do not reflect the actual truth revealed on this program. Episode 310 of the Weekend Review is in session. Taylor Phillips and Buck Gino. Follow me on Twitter at DT2Phillips. Follow Buck Gino on Twitter at Buck Gino the Third. Got some big topics to discuss. Only three of them, but they're very discussable and very big as usual. Involving the Red Wings, Tigers, and Michigan Wolverines. So, Let's get down to it. Are you out of your mind? Are you kidding me with this? You blew it! Oh, man. Man, that's the reaction from most fans. The Red Wings have retained general, poss- at least possibly retain general manager Ken Holland and head coach Jeff Blaschel with or without contract, according to Ans Arcan of MLive.com. Now, as aggravating as this may sound, there's a full analogy that I have in mind for myself. Now, the article, the body of the article reads, well, part of it does, Chris Elich wants Ken Holland to experience how a rebuild works. Now, from what we can tell, Ken Holland is still not a rebuilding general manager and may say no, in other words. Otherwise. So Chris Silich and Ken Holland may have a disagreement. But will they is one of our five questions in the end of the show. Now, the other thing is Holland is still rumored to be a top candidate for the Seattle NHL expansion franchise's GM gig. Now, that franchise doesn't open until 2020, and Holland... In other words, has to wait until then. Meantime, Holland has a decision to make to Chris Illich whether he wants to experience a rebuild or not. So this is actually more complicated than mind-boggling. Well, if you read the the stories that have been printed about the so-called extension or non-extension, as you will, um, it's hard to imagine any two people being more polar opposites on the situation than Ken Holland and Chris Illich. Um, Chris Illich not commenting at all on this, um, even though everybody that's reporting on it seems to think it's a done deal. And then you have Ken Holland who's saying, hey, I'm just going to show up and until my key doesn't work. I'm going to continue to show up. And when you look at just the situation, it kind of personifies what the Red Wings have gone through in the last five to seven years. Um, as Mike Illich declined in health and went up there in age, um, his grip on the team lessened, and he became more of Chris Illich's team and really empire as far as the Tigers and Red Wings are concerned to run. And you can see the mismanagement, and this is where it's gotten them. Uh, Ken Holland, he's not going to have a contract, but he's just going to keep showing up for work, and hopefully they keep paying him. I mean, it kind of reminds me of the the Milton character from Office Space, where he just keeps showing up, and then at some point they're going to fix the glitch, and he's not going to get a paycheck anymore, and they're going to have somebody else do the job. But at this point, when they're saying that 
there's no contract. There's been no talk of his future. But there's a report that says he's going to come back. Um, it, it's just mind-boggling because you have awesome. an owner who's saying he, he doesn't have any idea what he's going to do. You have a general manager whose contract is up who says he doesn't know what is in store for him. He's just going to keep showing up until his key doesn't work. Um, it just is mind-boggling that you could have a professional sports franchise that is that dysfunctional and that has that much of a divide in between the owner and the general manager. Uh, now, granted, that doesn't mean that other teams are perfect, but at least you kind of know what's going on. Sometimes guys get a bug up their ass and they'll say, I'm going to fire this guy today. Well, that does happen in sports. It happens in other businesses as well. But at least you have some sort of inkling of it to, to be happening. And for all this year, people have said that Ken Holland is going to move on. And he's not going to come back. And he's probably going to latch on with the new franchise that's going to pop up in Seattle here in about two to three years. And he's going to take a job there. Um, we'd love to have him. Um, it's a six-hour trip from his hometown in British Columbia to Seattle. So it's not a stretch to think that him going out to the West Coast would be a bad thing. And it all just seemed to make sense, especially with the fact that his contract hasn't been extended. But then they're reporting that he's just going to keep showing up. And Chris Illich, not a guy that's really known to break the bank for any type of coach or even players, for that matter. Um, he's just saying, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. And so this disconnect, this divide between the two guys that are supposed to be running this franchise, um, it, it's just very odd, and it, it's off-putting, and it's, and it's downright embarrassing uh, if you're somebody that's in that organization. And I think that if you're in that organization, whether it be Jeff Blashill, whether it be a player, whether it be some other type of staffer, you got to just wonder what's going on here. Uh, we don't even know who our boss is going to be. We don't even know if our boss is going to come back. We don't really know what's going on. All we know is that we're just going to keep showing up. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's just so odd. And it, but it also, like I said, it, it kind of personifies what this franchise has been about the last five to seven years. And that's just no direction, no goals. I mean, they can tell you that they want to make the playoffs. They can tell you that they want to remain competitive. But who's they make would suggest otherwise. And they just don't have any identity. Uh, nobody knows what this team's about anymore. The players don't have, know what this team's about. Um, they, all they can do is muster cliched statements about working hard and coming to work every day and all these other things that guys who really have no idea what their their team plan is. And, and it's, it's just amazing that they've gotten to this point. You talk about a team that had made 25 consecutive playoffs since 1990. And now you have a team that's in complete disarray. They have no idea what's going on. They don't even know who the general manager is going to be next season. You have the general manager now who doesn't have a contract that just says, I'm just going to keep showing up. The owner doesn't want to comment on it because he doesn't really want to take care of it. He's got, in his words, more pressing matters um, to, to take care of. I don't know what would be more pressing than having a general manager for one of the two sports franchises that you own, but um, that's Chris Illich. So um, it, it, it's just... It, it, it's a story that bears watching, not only from a local perspective, but from a national perspective as well, because for so long, Ken Holland has been revered, um, whether he earned it or not, from a lot of the national pundits and a lot of the guys that are, are visible on the broadcasting side of the NHL. And now you have this, where he literally is just saying, I'm just going to keep showing up until like, he stops working. That's what he's basically said. And... <clears throat> For somebody that has had as much success as Ken Holland has, even though he may not have been directly responsible for it, there's a lot of argument that can be had on either side there. Um, the, the point remains that he at least was credible for a very long time in the circles of the NHL, and people really did look up to him, and 
and thought the world of them, and now they have to be looking at this and going, I mean, what, what's going on down there? You know, it, it, it's just a complete catastrophe. So um, I, I think it's really just, it's dumb. Um, it tell, it basically, you're, you're taking the fans that have, uh, that you've just built this new arena that you'll hope they'll come to watch terrible hockey at, and you basically piss in their face because you said, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing with this team. It's just a new arena, show, by the way. It, it doesn't right, excite I mean, anybody. It, yeah, just go ahead and keep showing up and we'll figure it out. I mean, this is this is stuff that um, you know you would expect from non-traditional hockey markets or minor league stuff. I mean, this really is, you know, this is back in the day minor league stuff where guys didn't know where their checks were coming from or if their equipment was going to get repossessed or, you know, I don't, I'm not saying that the, the financial, uh, the health of the Red Wings is in that dire of straits, but I mean, as far as ownership goes, nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows who's doing what. You don't know, what, you have a general manager that literally is not going to have a contract after the season. And he's just going to keep showing up to work. I mean, uh, how dumb is that? It, it just, it, it boggles the mind, and like I said, it takes all the fans, and it basically tells them that you're too you're too stupid to figure this out. Just keep coming to the game, and we'll keep throwing the team on the ice, and that'll be good enough. I mean, Chris Illich uh, is, is not well liked by a lot of the people in those ownership circles. He's not a popular guy, even in his own organizations. People think he's a micromanager. People think that he meddles in too many things. He doesn't just stick to owning the team and cutting the checks. He actually tries to get involved and he has no background in any of these departments that he's trying to micromanage. He's just doing it because he's young. And I think that with all this talk of trying to rebuild and is Ken Hound going to want to rebuild? Is Chris Illich want to rebuild? Well, they can't even decide on who the hell is going to be there. So if they're going to decide what their team is going to do, you first have to figure out who the fuck is going to show up to work and who's going to be doing what the owner tells you to do. Um, and it really tells me, uh, from all the things that have been said over the last couple of days about this topic, that Chris Illich doesn't care. He's moved on to the Tigers. The Red Wings are dead. Um, they haven't been in the playoff hunt almost the entire season. And he really just doesn't care. And I don't, I'm not sure if he ever really is going to care. Because if you look at what's going Chris on. Chris Illich never is one, by the way. I mean, well, he I know gutted it. the Tigers payroll. He, he gutted the Tigers payroll last year. And we see what that has resulted in so far this year. We'll get to that here later. Um, we've seen what that's resulted in. And now you have the Red Wings where he's basically just saying, I really don't care. I'm just going to continue to go on and whoever shows up for work shows up for work. Um, I, I don't care. I've got other stuff to, to worry about. I mean, your owner is basically, if I'm a player, I'm like, he, does, he, he obviously doesn't care about us. He doesn't care that we stink or he doesn't care if we, we're good um, because we're in the playoffs and he seems to just have other things going on. So um, it, it's just, it, it's one of those things that for the Red Wings, it's, it's kind of ground zero. Um, we always keep saying uh, they really got to hit rock bottom for them to change the way they are. Well, if you can't figure out who the fuck your general manager is going to be, that's probably rock bottom. So they need to figure something out. I wish Chris Illich would sell the team. He's probably not going to. So your best hope now is that at this point that he finally gets his head screwed on. He puts a general manager in place that will rebuild the team, kind of like the Tigers are doing, which is putting young guys in position to develop at the major league level. And I think that if you were to weigh the two franchises right now, yeah, a lot of people think Al Avila is doing a bad job, but the, the point being is that's how you rebuild a team. Baseball-wise, they are doing a lot of the things that you need to to rebuild a team, and there are some t people that will have different opinions on that, but the, the fact is that they are playing guys that really don't have a whole lot of business on being a, on, of being on a major league roster. But they are going to do that because there's no motivation for them to 
continue to to draw any sort of attention. They're not going to be in the playoff run. They cut all the payroll. The only big name player they have left that has any sort of term on his contract is Miguel Cabrera. And they literally, after Victor Martinez leaves this year, um, they won't have any big contracts other than Cabrera's on the books. Um, you can kind of count Nick Castellanos as one, but it's not really the biggest contract. I mean, it's not something that's overwhelmingly bad. Um, so you're talking about a team that literally is going to be stripped bare by the end of this season and bereft of any you know, uh, recognizable talent other than Miguel Cabrera. Can I say I something guess. here? Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Let, remember last year, Jeff Moss wrote an article ke- headlining Kelly Alleged Telling Friends that the Tigers and Red Wings will be sold. That was last year on March 8th. 13 months ago on March 8th. Mm-hmm. And uh, since then, we haven't heard anything because. So I assume that we that we can't really tell whether he's not whether if he's not going to sell it. He he's, he still probably may if you at, at least right. well, because they're still the facing will, tax, tax issues. Yeah, the one thing I will say is that if you look at the Tigers and you look how the Red Wings are running right now, um, this is not something that looks like a viable long term plan. Not, have, not having a general manager for one, and going all four of the Marlins on your roster, and just stripping it completely bare. Um, the only reason they can't get rid of Miguel Cabrera is because nobody will have him. Right, because so, he's expensive. That's one thing. Yeah, I mean, he's expensive. It's expensive. He's old. He's hurt. I mean... <laughs> well, he's actually getting better health-wise, but... The rest right, of the team, I mean, yeah. I mean, he's, he's what, 36 now? Uh, I can't tell. because. But the point is, the rest, the entire team, yeah. otherwise, not just Miguel it we're not basing it on one player. No, it's the entire no, the team. Rest of the, team garbage. The, I mean, the rest of the, the rest team, of yeah. It, it's bad. Right. I mean, they have young guys that they're hoping that develop, and that's what this year is for, and that's fine. But, I mean... It's it just when you talk about selling the team, there hasn't been any reports of that happening in the mainstream media, which you probably aren't going to get anyway because they don't dig deep enough. But <laughs> this is something to me that looks like the start of I'm getting ready to sell these things off because I'm trying to save as much money as I can so that the person buying it doesn't have to have. A lot of right. troubled assets. Because the only yeah. way to save money, to save the best way to save money is to sell those teams. Right. I mean, it, it, it's just shaping up to that if he's not going to run the team, if he's not going to have somebody to run the team, what's he going to do with them? Is he just going to let, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that can't happen. And, he's got to sell them. I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, you would think that he's gearing up for something because you can't just not pay attention to one of the two cornerstones of your empire, which are your sports franchises. Yeah, he's got a lot of other businesses. He's got eleven businesses, including Little Caesars, which is right, which is awful. Address, that he's addressed in the article. He's, I mean, that was his comment. He's like, I've got a lot of things. That I've got, you know, Chris Illich. This is Chris Illich saying this. And we have 11 operating companies that we're involved with, Tigers Red Wings being two of those. Today in Lakeland, Florida, this is the day of the interview, so this is five days ago. This is spring training for the Tigers. So I'm happy to talk to you about the Tigers, and really want to keep the focus today on the Detroit Tigers. Yeah. And then that they asked if Jay Powell was going to come back. He says, I'll be happy to take any more questions you have on the Tigers. So he's basically saying to the eunuch reporters, I'm not going to talk about the Red Wings right now. Right, they're basically dead. they're basically dead to him, and that to me signals something a little bit more than just ah, we'll, we'll wait. I mean, your season's going to be ending here in two weeks. You might want to have a long term plan past that day. And he 
so far either isn't telling anybody or he just doesn't have one. Mm-hmm. Yep. And Jeff Blashill, his contract expires next season. And he's got to be wondering who's my boss going to be. At the end of next season, yeah. Me. Right. But he's going to have next season. He's thinking, who, who's going to be my boss next year? Am I going to be here? Because when the boss comes in, he might clean the house. We'll find out soon so, enough or probably later I mean, in the we, summer. We yeah, we will. But, I mean, it, it's just one of those things that it's <clears throat> it, it, it just – it just is, it's a puzzle, and nobody's going to be able to solve it until somebody says something. Yeah, it's unsolvable until there are answers. That, But that's why, that's why there's, there's this Michigan, there's, there's us, the Michigan Sports Truth. We try to crack down the facts and give people the lowdown on what exactly is going on here. So uh, the, the question, uh, the other thing I want to touch on, though, is... Uh, What's what's Ken Holland going to do between now and 2020? Yeah, I mean, if he doesn't have a contract, what's he going to do? Is he just going to sit there and wait for Seattle to pick him up? Is he going to sit there and experience a rebuild or take another assistant, take an assistant GM gig is, I mean, at another NHL team? I mean, it could be just that as Chris always say, hey, you're going to rebuild. This is what we're going to do, and if you don't like it, we'll find somebody else that'll do it. That's another one of our five questions. Do it. Yeah, kind of, and then we'll talk about that later, but that's kind of what it seems like to me. It is, that's kind of in the gauntlet that's, that's been laid down. Yep. Speaking of the Tigers, that one is long gone. The inevitable and glorious 0 3 start to the 2018 MLB regular season. <laughs> They lose 13 to 10 in 13 innings on opening day. And then they lose one nothing today in game one of the doubleheader, which was made up. And 8-6 to six of the Pittsburgh Pirates, in, in which Ryan Carpenter, one Ryan Carpenter, that is, making his, uh, made his MLB debut through two solid innings, but then realities uh, caved in as beginner's luck. He... He gave up at least three runs. He, he, get, he got rocked. Buck Farmer got rocked as well. Tigers tried catching up, but still, the Pirates win 8-6. to six. They're 3-0. and oh, Tigers 0-3. Oh everybody, was, everybody was excited on opening day that the Tigers, they, th- they thought the Tigers were indeed an actually good team when, when the reality actually set in. I mean, the call on the play of the play, it, there was no tag whatsoever, but th- this is a this is a thing they've got to rise above. Their pitching was shit. Their defense was shit that, that, in that game. Three fucking errors. And, uh, the pitching staff had seven pitchers in there, and they threw a total ERA of 7... 796, I believe. That's what I calculated. In the box from the box score, you got to pitch better than that, and to win games in eight and a half innings. By the way, you got to you got to pitch a lot better than that. That that's that's called getting over it. That's called being better for it. Yeah, I mean, if your offense is going to score you ten runs, you'd hope to get away with a win, and that didn't happen. Um, Controversial to play at the plate that the game was going to end, and then they ruled that it didn't. Um, they, they go on to extra innings. You got to remember that two times earlier in that game, they had bases loaded with nobody out and didn't score. I mean, come on. Pitching stinks. You can't drive guys in when you have bases loaded and nobody out. Um, that, that's a preview. That's going to be 162 games of this crap. And, <clears throat> you know, you're not going to get anybody to watch that. It's just not going to happen. No, it's not. You blew it! Yeah, the Tigers keep blowing every opportunity, and, and they pay for it. They got the Kansas City Royals also winless at 0-2, part of the AL Company Central, and then they go to Chicago at a guaranteed rate field and play the White Sox, who are undefeated at 2-0, and Thursday at 4-10, and then Saturday and Sunday at 2-10. The, the Royals games... 
all Monday through Wednesday at 110. So an easy team and then a hard team. Yeah, I don't know if it really matters at this point. I'm sure they'll pick up their first win somewhere. Yeah, um, can't lose them all. Come, chance, chance is either going to probably clash with the Royals and maybe be able to pull one of those out, but it's going to be a long season. As evidenced by their 0-3 start, it's just, it's just been a, a dumpster fire from the beginning, and it's what a lot of people predicted. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like USA Today projected, 63 wins, 99 losses. ESPN ranked them 29 in power rankings. That's accurate as well. Yeah, I mean, the only team that's probably going to be worse than them is the Marlins. Right, um, exactly. The Marlins are, 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 tr- are trash cheap, too, so that's what you get. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Bad karma is a bitch. So... Let's go on to something positive. For three, yes, sir! The Wolverines of Michigan in Ann Arbor have delivered the knockout punch on the Loyola the Chicago Ramblers, running away in the end by 12, 69-57. Some, ter- some of the turnovers were forced, others were giveaways. That The first half was, was a steaming pile of cow shit. Not only was... was was defense the factor, but also missing a lot of close range shots. And Mo Wagner did most of the work. Others others uh, didn't step up. And then later, and it stayed that way just to begin the second half. But what? But as the second half progressed, Michigan started playing more as a team. Duncan Robinson hit a couple threes, and then Muhammad Ali Abdul Rahman got his game back. Jordan Poole stepped up as well. That remember he was the hero with that buzzer beater against Montana in the Sweet 16. Houston. Yeah, Houston, rather. Pa- pardon me. Yep. It, it, he was in the Sweet 16. Yep. Montana was in the round of 64. Apologies for that one. But the Wolverines devastated Houston. And the Wolverines keep, keep devastating every every opponent. And now they're get, they head to the national championship game against the Villanova Wildcats which tips off Monday at 9.20 on TBS and TNT, primarily TBS, as most of us would view. But uh, it, the just-in-case channel would be TNT. But Villanova spanked Kansas in that second national semifinal. Well, I, we'll talk about the Michigan game first. Obviously, a game of runs. And... Yeah. Michigan made the first run, getting out 12-4. to four. And then Loyola closed out that first half, being up by seven. And it was real dire straits for Michigan. They didn't look cohesive. They didn't look at all like the team that had gotten to the Final Four. But they started to play, like you said, as a team. I mean, if, if, you, if you take Mo Wagner away in the first half, they, they literally had nothing. I mean, their, their offense was missing and hope Mo Wagner gets rebounded and puts it back because that's all that they had in the first half. And then Charles Matthews started to feel it a little bit in the second half, started to be able to get to the rack, and that opened up some opportunities for some other guys. Uh, Duncan Robinson hit some big shots. Uh, Xavier Simpson looked absolutely lost out there, scored no points, oh for everything I'm shooting, and just looked, like I said, I mean, he, he was just... Nothing going for him. Um, the guard play, other than Charles Matthews, was pretty spotty at best. Jordan Poole hit a couple of shots in the second half, but it was really the Mo Wagner, Charles Matthews show, and a couple of other guys hitting some bigger shots to help them pull away in the second half. The amazing thing about that second half was that they scored 47 points, Thanks. which was the same total that they had in the second half against Texas A&M. And that 47 point, it didn't seem like they scored 47, but they did. And Mo Wagner took over. He was hitting from outside. He hit from inside. He had 24 points and 15 rebounds. Just really carried the team on his back. And they were able to outdistance the Royal Chicago Ramblers. Ended up winning by 12, but it was a struggle for most of the game. And then you could tell. 
as the midpoint of the second half got got through. Uh, Michigan just started to be able to impose its way a little bit more. Loyola just couldn't hang on. They seemed to be a little bit out of gas, and they weren't getting some co- any contributions from a lot of their backcourt either. Um, you had guys that were in single digits that were used to scoring double digits. Uh, Clayton Custer, really the only guard that had a, a fine showing offensively. He had 15 points, but no rebounds, no assists. Um, you look at the assists category for Loyola, a team that really prides itself on ball movement and smart offensive play. They only had six assists the entire game. And when you're a team that relies on having good offensive movement and being able to expose the defense, that tells me that they weren't able to do that. Credit goes to Michigan's defense as well, but Loyola just looked out of sorts, especially in that second half. This couldn't get anything going, and they had their cold spell at one of the worst possible times, which was down the stretch, and Michigan was able to take advantage, and they were able to pull ahead for that victory, and they'll meet Villanova in the title game tomorrow. Villanova, as you mentioned, beat a comatose Kansas squad. Um, Villanova was just hitting everything from deep. They had 13 threes in the first half. I mean, <clears throat> Kansas just never, never defensively were able to get their feet under them, and Villanova took full advantage, and they will meet Michigan in the championship game. And all bets are off when you get to that point. Um, you can talk about how they played. You can talk about all these matchups. It's, it's a one-game, winner-take-all type of situation. And for Michigan... I don't know if they can shoot any worse than they did against Loyola. Um, you would hope that they would be able to be able to do better. And boy, if they can just back Villanova off the three-point line, make them go inside, and earn their points down low, uh, Michigan's got a puncher's chance. But they've got to hit their shots. They've got to hit their open shots. And that was something that they weren't able to do for most of the game against Loyola. And if they're going to be the national champions. They're going to have to earn it because Villanova, obviously, a very good basketball team. And it's going to come down to who's hitting their open shots and who's going to make it work. And right now, Michigan defensively, yeah, they're, they're still playing well defensively overall, but they have not played a team like Villanova uh, in a long time. Um, they have not played a team that strong. Right. And they're going to have to step it up. They're going to have to really yeah. step it up. But what they've got to do is they're going to have to be very aggressive on the perimeter, and they're going to have to make Villanova go inside. Because Villanova, yes, they are a very versatile team. They can get their points there, but they would obviously prefer to get some ball movement going and hit the outside jumpers where there's open shots. And you're really going to have to lock down on those guys and hope that Mo Wagner and John Teske can keep it to a bare minimum inside. And if Michigan hits their shots, you know, the same goes for them. They would prefer to get the ball moving moving, and, and have guys taking open outside jumpers, but that didn't happen in the final four game. And Charles Matthews is going to be a guy to watch. But I cannot imagine that Muhammad Ali, Abdi Rahman, and Xavier Simpson are going to have as bad a game as they did yesterday, tomorrow. I, I just don't see them going for a combined seven points. I think that Xavier Simpson, obviously, the bright lights kind of hit him hard. And he was just on offense a non-factor. And Abdul Rahman got a little bit going in the second half. But those are the two guys that if they can get them going and get everybody else involved and keep them at their current level with Matthews, Wagner, and whoever else decides to step up. Um, it's going to be an interesting game, but if Michigan does not hit their shots, they're not going to be able to stay with Villanova like they have all the other teams they have in this tournament so far, because Villanova will make you pay. So Everybody has, has to step to, up. Has to hit their shots and really just to keep pace with Villanova, and you hope that your defense can do just enough. Yeah. The one, the one person that I know that's not going to step up at all is Simmons. 
because he he was a, an absolute dud in Saturday's game. Yeah, yeah he hit one shot. It was a three pointer. But I mean, they were really trying to go with anybody they could find. I mean, they brought in E.B. Watson for two possessions, and he was. They brought in Eli Brooks for a little bit. He wasn't any good. And so they had to kind of go back to their regular rotation and hope that some of those, somebody from there would rise up. And Charles Matthews, thankfully for them, did and came away with 17 points. But um, you're going to have to get more production out of Xavier Simpson and Abdur Rockman. That's going to be the key tomorrow. If Xavier Simpson and, and Abdur Rockman start hitting, that's going to open up a whole lot of opportunities for other guys. And that's how you're going to have to hope that game goes if you're a Michigan fan because if it goes the same way it did Saturday, it's going to be a long game. Yeah. And that's exactly what I see in my crystal ball. So, let's get to those five questions. Shall we? It's time for five questions on the Michigan Sports Truth. Question number one, could Chris Silich and Ken Holland have a disagreement over plans of a rebuild for the Red Wings? Well, I don't know if it's a plan of a rebuild, but they certainly don't see eye to eye on what the team is doing, simply because he hasn't extended him an offer for beyond this season, and he doesn't feel the need to have any sort of urgency, he being Chris Illich, of cementing what the future is going to be. I mean, there's just no urgency at all. So I definitely think there's going to be a disagreement there. It just depends on what that disagreement is. Is it he wants to rebuild and and cut salary and do the same thing he's done with the Tigers, which is limit salary, put a bunch of young guys out there who are cheap and hopefully develop them that way. And Ken Holland, as we know, is loath to that idea. So there could be a a definite disagreement there, but there's just so much going on with that that I just can't see how they would be in agreement on how this team is being run right now. And it's quite quite obvious in the way that both of them are talking right now because uh, unless there's secret meetings that nobody knows anything about, it doesn't seem like the other one, one knows what the other one is doing or plans to be doing. Next question. Question number two, if Holland does disagree, let's say he did with Chris Illich, then would Chris Illich ask him to leave, whether he quit or be fired or forced resignation or termination, or would he be forced to stay and experience the rebuild anyway? That's a good question. Um, (laughs) Stumped you on that one. I guess if he wants to keep doing what he's doing, he's going to kind of have to find out what Chris Illich wants to happen and go along with it. Because if he wants to continue to be the general manager of the team, he kind of needs to know what the plan is. And it doesn't seem like he knows exactly what Chris Illich wants. So Ken Howard is just going to keep doing what he does until he gets told different or until he can't do it, which means that he's not a member of the organization anymore. So I don't know if Chris Illich will get rid of him, or if he's just hoping that he can drive him out with not really having to actually confront him and, and just hope that Ken Holland quits out of frustration, which is not something that Ken Holland will do. Like As we mentioned, Ken Holland just said he's going to keep showing up until his key doesn't work. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's an odd situation, but I think that if Ken Holland wants to keep being the general manager, He's going to have to do what Chris Illich wants him to do, and that might be a complete overhaul and rebuild of the team. And that's and that's exactly where Holland targets. That's that's exactly where this is being targeted here, whether Holland still wants to rebuild or not. Next question. Question number three. Could the Wings fall to a lower draft pick in the lottery again this year, like they did last year? Last year they were seven, and they dropped to nine. This year they're they've won. They're looking at number six as of right now. They 
first, maybe number seven, but they've won three straight, two of them against bad teams, and one of them over a good team in the Pittsburgh Penguins. They're, they got the Blue Jackets in Columbus Tuesday at 7. They're home against the lowly Montreal Canadiens at 7.30. And then the New York Islanders come into town at Little Caesars Arena Saturday at 7 to end the NHL regular season. Looking at the league standings here, the Red Wings, looking at 6th or 7th place here, they are looking at 6th place. 30, 38, and 11 with 71 points. Only three points back of the Islanders, Oilers, and Blackhawks. But they're probably they're probably going to be mediocre anyway. But could, question number three is, again, could the Wings fall to a lower draft pick in the lottery again this year? If they do, it's, be, it's probably going to be bad karma again, like last year. Yeah, I mean, they're currently sixth worst in the NHL. Yeah. Um, the Islanders are three points ahead of them, tied with Edmonton, and then Chicago, as you mentioned. And they're playing a team that's almost directly below them in Montreal. And they also have a team um, directly ahead of them in the, in the Islanders that are going to play this week. So the results against those teams are going to be very critical. Um, when it comes to the odds, um, you know, you try to drive those odds as best you can. Well, winning three straight isn't going to do it. Um, had they gone 500 or split the points instead of getting six, only getting three, they'd be tied right now with Montreal for the um, fourth worst record instead of being six. So, um, you know, with the lottery the way it is, um, the top three teams obviously get the best odds, and then it kind of falls down from there. Um, we'll see what happens, but they definitely could fall out of that sixth spot, depending on how the ping-pong balls fall, and they could definitely get a lower pick than what they project out to be right now. Yeah, that's exactly on target. Next question. Question number four. Do the Michigan Wolverines need more players to step up besides Mo Wagner? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, if they want to win a national championship, Mo Wagner is not going to be able to do it by himself. And it's going to fall to those guys that struggled in the game on Saturday. Um, Muhammad Ali, Abdul Rahman, and Xavier Simpson, uh, the two top offenders on that list. And they're going to have to step up. And the bench is going to have to do a little bit better than they did on Saturday offensively if they're going to want to win that game. So, yeah, a definite yes to that. It's just going to depend on who it's going to be. And when you get to those championship games, it's all hands on that situation. So I don't think that Xavier Simpson, I think that Xavier Simpson continues his current state of play, which is pretty bad. I don't think that John Beeline would hesitate to reach it down to his bench and try to find a spark from somebody a lot earlier than he did on Saturday. Yeah. I'd be surprised if the Wolverines came out hot shooting against the Villanova Wildcats. Next question. Finally, question number five. This is actually a prediction question. Who wins the national championship game and what score? I'm going to go ahead and go first and predict precautionary-wise. Villanova by 23, 83 to 60. Yeah, I don't know if Villanova defensively has enough in the tank to hold Michigan. Um, I don't know if it'll be that wide of a margin, but right now it's tough to say that Michigan's going to win that game simply because of the performance that they've had throughout this tournament, with the exception of Texas A&M. Um, they've been pretty bad offensively, and they've done just enough on that end and played pretty good defense the rest of the way and pulled ahead late in most of their games. And that's not a type of game that you can win against a team like Villanova. You can do that against teams like Forest State, like Montana, and like Houston, but you can't do that against Villanova. It's just not something that you're going to want to do. So my prediction is that it's going to be a close game, but I, I just I, right now it's hard for me to say that Michigan's going to win that game based on the performance that they've had in the NCAA tournament because if you take away that Texas A&M game, 
They have not shot the ball well. Their offense has been pretty disjointed. And you just, when you're playing a national championship game, that's not a way to go into it and, and win. So unless they find some magic spark that allows them to hit a lot more shots than they have been, um, Villanova's going to be the champion for the second time in three years. Yep. Mm-hmm. So uh, do you have a score prediction? Just to top, put the chair on top well, of I Sunday? Mean, looking at what, yeah, look at, look at, looking at what Villanova's done and what Michigan's done, I think Michigan probably will fare better than 60 points. Um, I think that I'm going to go with Villanova 84 and Michigan 71. Okay, by 13. All right. So your spread against my spread. May the best team win. So that wraps up our five questions segment and to our entire audience. If you want to answer those five questions, just replay that segment portion of this episode and answer them the best you can without going out of line. Pencils down, everyone. It's time to find out what's your grade. Only one event to grade, and it's going to be pretty damn low. Chris Silich's apparent decision to make Ken Holland experience a rebuild. Well, right now his decision gets me a, a, a D minus because he hasn't made one. Um, at least publicly, he has not said what he's going to do. He's got other things in, going on, according to him. So he doesn't have time to decide who's going to be his general manager or what the plan's going to be. So um, I think if he's going to make Ken Holland experience a rebuild, we're going to tell him exactly what moves need to be made. Um, you know, I think Ken Holland is probably going to say, you know, thanks, but no thanks. I want to run it my way. And even though that way hasn't gotten them any success in the past three to four seasons. And that leaves Chris Illich with a, with a hard decision. Right. I mean, I think that Chris Illich is trying to get away from firing him because he doesn't want to fire him. But Ken Holland is a guy that's just going to back away. And it's going to come down to Chris Illich having to, having to fire him or replacing him with a new general manager and a new contract for Ken Holland to finally be gone. Because Ken Holland said he's just going to keep showing up. So right now, the way that they're going about this is very strange. And mm-hmm. it's we're not going to find out what the end point is. But right now, Chris Illich is getting D- minus because the only reason he hasn't failed yet is because he hasn't made the decision. And until he makes a decision, it's hard to give him a full grade. But the way he's going about it right now is, is really odd and just it doesn't make any sense. Right. But that's exactly the way I detect it. So that's our What's Your Grade segment. So for our audience, if they have a grade for each event, for only that event this week, for example, post it in the comment bank in this episode and please don't go out of line. That's episode 310 of the Week in Review. That was awesome, with awesome hot-button topics. Before we sign off, we want to remind everyone to share this episode on our entire podcast on social media and have their friends share that as well because we want to tell them that the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast is searching for a wider local audience that is fans of sports, Michigan sports, that is. So please spread the word about the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, its Facebook page, and its Twitter handle at Michigan underscore truth. Buck Gino, great job as always. I'll talk to you again next week. All right, thanks. Yep. I'm Taylor Phillips. Follow me on Twitter at DT2Phillips and Buck Gino on Twitter at Buck Gino the third. We'll talk to you next week on episode 311 of the Week in Review. Go Blue. Thanks very much for listening, downloading, and sharing. TTFN, ta-ta for now. The hosts of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast do not take any suggestions or criticism from any member of its audience on how it should be run. It is up to the host to decide what they want to cover. They also do not intend to be any amount of popular in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Additionally, the views of the audience, right or wrong, do not reflect the actual truth revealed on this program.